So welcome back to uh, Unit 3, Higher Chemistry. Uh, today's lesson is going to focus on industrial processes and how you can get the most out of your reactants to maximise your profits and minimise your environmental damage or impact. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to learn. Um, now the chemical industry is one of the largest industries in Britain and the world. It is a billion approaching a trillion dollar industry. Chemical products are essential for every aspect of our lives and um, that's only going to continue and um, just the nature of the chemicals will change. Industrial processes are designed to maximise profit and minimise the effect on the environment. Obviously, that first one has been the main goal for many decades, and increasingly, the new effort is to minimise the effect on the environment, and that is where a lot of chemical advances are being made, and will be an ongoing challenge for your generation and generations to come moving forward. So we're going to look at the economic factors first, how to maximise profit. Well, you want to make sure that your feedstocks, and we'll get on to the exact definition of that, but that's the chemicals you use, are available and sustainable and not costing you too much. You want to look for where you can recycle any materials that you produce. You want to consider what energy you are using. Um, can you reduce that? And can you potentially get your energy from a renewable source? If your chemical process produces more than one product, which is very common, um, are you able to make use of that byproduct or sell it on to someone else? In fact, a lot of our common cleaning products, things like bleach and also things like hydrochloric acid, are not made on their own. They are the byproducts of other processes which then get sold and used and are quite profitable as a side product. You want to consider your product yield. So that's in terms of your atom economy and also your percentage yield. So those equations that we learned previously are really important on um, maximizing profit. And you also need to think about your costs. So what you need to pay your workforce, how much it's going to cost you to get materials to your um, chemical plant and then to get your chemicals to whoever wants to buy them and how much it costs to run your facility. In regards to minimising environmental, environmental impact, there are three main things to consider. How do you minimise waste? This is where atom economy comes into it. If you've got a chemical process that has a 100% atom economy, you should have hardly any waste. Trying to avoid the use or production of toxic substances. So that means careful attention to the chemicals you use and also looking at your atom economy to try and minimise the chances of there being a side product which could be toxic. And finally, if you are developing a material that's going to be used for lots of things, you want to make sure that that chemical is biodegradable if it is not being designed to be kept for a long time, for example, if it's a type of plastic, you want to make sure that that is not going to accumulate in the environment. You want it to be biodegradable. Now, I previously mentioned about feedstocks and raw materials. Now, these are two terms that you need to know the difference because they are related to one another, but there is a key difference. Now, a raw material is anything that you do not need to process and can put into a chemical reactor. So things like fossil fuels, crude oil, gas, water, air, min uh, minerals and metal oils and rocks are all raw materials. Raw materials can sometimes be converted into things we call feedstocks. Uh, to go into your reactor. And a feedstock is a simple chemical or mixture that is derived from raw materials. So for example, if air is the raw material, 
If you isolate nitrogen from the air and use it, nitrogen is a feedstock. If you take chalk, the rock, and purify it to get pure calcium carbonate, the calcium carbonate is a feedstock. If it has been processed, it is no longer a raw material, it is only a feedstock. However, a raw material can also be a feedstock. So technically, anything going into the reactor is a feedstock, but it is better if you're asked to identify a feedstock that you pick something that has been processed first. If there are no chemicals that you can find in the question uh, that have been processed and put into the reactor, just pick anything going into the reactor as a feedstock. But a raw material is something that has not been processed and typically a feedstock is something that has needed to be processed first. When it comes to um, running a reactor, there are two types of reactor processes. You can have a batch process, uh, and that is like baking cupcakes. Um, you mix all your ingredients together, you put them in the oven, and there you have your cupcakes. If you want to make more cupcakes, you have to clean up and start again. Um, so a batch process is one where you have fixed quantities that you put in, you do the reaction, you monitor what's going on, you then purify your final product, and then you start again with a new batch of chemical reactants. A continuous process is different. A continuous process is where the process is running almost 24 seven, and you're constantly putting in new reactants, feeding it in to the reactor, and you're getting product out at the end. Um, a batch process gives you a lot more control. A continuous process gives you a lot more volume of product. And so each process has advantages and disadvantages. Um, for batch processes, they are much more versatile. They can be adapted for multi-step reactions, um, but are typically used on small scale reactions. The problem is that when you do a batch reactor, a batch reaction, if you have contamination, it can be a very serious issue. There are many times at which your reactor is turned off because you're purifying the product. And because the reactions tend to be more complicated and multi-step, safety can be a bigger issue. For continuous processes, benefit is that you can make huge quantities in a year. It is excellent for single step processes or processes that don't require purification. And a continuous process can be automated more easily, therefore reducing your costs on employees. The problems are that um, continuous processes tend to be done on a massive scale. So you do have to pay a lot to set up your plant. Once it's been developed, it is much less flexible. And often in order to make a profit, you do need to run your reactor 24 seven, which means if you do have a technical issue, you can put yourself in risk of losing money. You don't need to know a lot of detail about these. The main thing is that batch um, is better for small quantities, continuous for large quantities. Uh, batch processes is how all pharmaceuticals are made. It's also how high quality products are made like whiskies or gins. Um, continuous processes are used for more day-to-day uh, -day things. So plastics, a polymerization reaction is done in continuous. The blast furnace, which is how we get iron out of iron ore, that is also a continuous process. And you are also familiar with the Haber process for making ammonia, which is a continuous process. Now costs, um, don't worry so much about the specifics of this slide. You just need to have a general awareness that things cost money. Um, now the term capital cost just means the money you have to put up up front to design and build your plant. Fixed costs, are any cost that doesn't change with how much product is made. 
Um, and actually, when it comes to the chemical industry, fixed costs are quite um, hard to come by. You tend to have more variable costs. So your variable costs um, relate to the cost of oil for transporting raw materials to you or away for, uh, your products away. The cost of your feedstocks and raw materials, the cost of energy for running things. And so there is a lot of things that cost money that you need to make sure you're generating enough money or revenue to cover those costs. Finally, um, locating your chemical industry. Again, this is just something to have an awareness of. You don't need to know the specific details of this. A lot of this is sort of common knowledge or logical. When you are building a power plant, you want to make sure that you have a water supply. Um, that is um, mostly for cooling things down, but it can also be as a raw material or feedstock. Uh, so most chemical plants are built near rivers or lakes. You want to make sure that your raw materials are not too far away. So a lot of chemical plants are built near quarries or uh, near oil fields. You want to make sure that you've got good communications. So essentially that means good transport links. So again, you want to be near motorways or near train stations or near uh, ports or airports potentially, but usually it's most likely going to be um, a boat or a train or lorries um, distributing your products. You want to make sure you've got a reliable energy supply and lots of chemical plants now will have wind turbines built um, on site in order to make sure that they are not only using renewable energy, um, but they have a reliable source of energy that they themselves are in charge of. And you also want to make sure that if your process requires a high level of skill, that you're able to attract people to your location. Now, the final thing is just a couple of hints on the types of questions that get asked in the SQA. There are a lot of questions that show flow charts of loads of reactions going in, lots of chemical steps happening, and then you've got products coming out. Related to flow charts, there are two types of question, and these are the hints for how to answer them. So the first type of question is, show how this process saves money or is efficient. So what you're looking for is, does the process use any free raw materials? Air and seawater, river water are completely free. So you do not have to pay for those at all. The second thing is look for any time that a chemical has been recycled. So a recycled chemical, you can identify it in that there is an arrow coming out at the end of the process, which then gets fed back into the start of the process. If you are recycling any chemical, you're automatically saving money. And the final one, which is less obvious, is look and see if they've used any catalysts. If a process uses a catalyst, it allows the reaction to be done at a lower temperature and pressure, which saves you money because the energy requirements of keeping things at high temperature and high pressure is really high. If you can reduce that by using a catalyst, you will save yourself an enormous amount of money. The second type of question is draw an arrow to show how a process can be made more efficient. And this is just identifying where chemicals can be recycled. And um, so look for any chemical that is both an input, so goes into the flowchart, and an output, something that comes out of the flowchart. Draw an arrow showing it going from an output to the input. It's usually from the bottom of the flowchart to the top of the flowchart. And you've done this before, and you should be very familiar with it because it's exactly the arrow that you would have learnt to draw for the recycling of hydrogen and nitrogen in the Haber process. Uh, so this video has been a, an examination of understanding how to get the most out of your reactants and uh, thank you for your attention.